Thank you very much, Peter, uh, for that presentation and for uh, some excellent slides and a, a very passionate exposition of the evidence and the case, the compelling case that certainly you and others put to me uh, a bit little over 18 months ago, which set us on this journey. So it's a real pleasure to be here this morning to, to be speaking to you, to be taking part uh, in this conference and to be um, playing a part in developing the idea of a IAP for children and young people. Um, there are some statistics that for me never lose their impact. Uh, they demand a response. They demand action. And one of those statistics that I want to particularly refer to today is the fact that one in 10 children uh, in this country between the age of five and 16 years of age has a clinically diagnosable mental health problem. And all of them, I believe, should have the best possible evidence-based care. And that's my ambition, it's the government's ambition uh, that CYP IAPT will help them get just that. And um, Peter, you talked about uh, your 35 years of working, uh, working life and that the job you're doing now is the best job that you've uh, done in those 35 years. I think for me, if I look across the very broad portfolio of responsibilities I have in the Department of Health, that this area is probably the thing that I care most about, that I feel most passionate about, that I think is probably the thing that I will look back on uh, in my time as a minister as being the best part of my working life as a minister. So uh, I certainly share that feeling with you, Peter. Now, that's why I've been doing everything I can, everything I can in the Department of Health to support you and the program uh, deliver. And that's why uh, that recently led to us, as we've heard already, us securing an extra £22 million over the next three years. And that money, as we've heard, but I just want to underscore a little, has gone straight into three very critical sets of actions. First, it's gone into extending the reach of the IAP program so that more children in more parts of our country will actually benefit. And secondly, it's gone into increasing the range, the range of evidence-based therapies that children are offered. As we've heard, systemic family therapy and interpersonal psychotherapy will help address problems like eating disorders, depression, self-harm, and conduct problems. And third, the money has gone into developing, and it's still a work in progress, new e-learning tools, so that staff in all sorts of settings around our country, from GP surgeries and schools to faith centres and many other places, police stations and so on, can get better at working with children and young people uh, with mental health problems. So in short, we're making a relatively small amount of money work really hard to go as far as it possibly can. It means more young people, as a result, will have access to more help. And like I said, that simply wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened without many of the people in this room today who have been inspiring leaders of this program so far. In fact, CYP IAPT wouldn't have happened at all. This has all been down to a truly Herculean effort by you and your colleagues. Indeed, many of you have got uh, this going within an academic year working through the night, I am told, in some cases, and certainly over weekends, putting your lives, in some cases, on hold in order to actually make sure this took place. And I also know that you've had exceptional help from colleagues in the Department of Health, colleagues like Karen Turner over here, or Catherine Pugh somewhere over there, uh, or indeed Peter himself, uh, among others, who have been, I think, both driven in their uh, desire to see this happen and have also been critical in driving this project forward and I think display absolutely fantastic enthusiasm in everything that they do. In such a unique program, there are, I think, so many things to celebrate and I would like to highlight the input that children and young people themselves have played in helping to shape this program. I think that does make it unique. I think it makes it something really very special indeed. And we know all about the work that uh, Young Minds has done, that Youth Access and others have done to support the project. But I also wanted to acknowledge and pay tribute to the work of young people themselves in taking forward the various collaboratives, bringing valuable insight uh, to the selection of candidates to join the collaboratives. Indeed, perhaps some of the most incisive and forensic questioning in some cases have come from the young people themselves to test which of the collaboratives 
were fit and ready to go at the earliest opportunity. Indeed, shaping self-referral schemes and giving constructive feedback at all levels of the program. And I think their advice has meant that IAPT services will be stronger and will be as strong as possible as it expands into new parts of the country. Now, we had always planned, as Peter said, for a fourth collaborative program to join the original three that we announced last year. But the new funding that we secured does now mean that we can announce a fifth collaborative as well. And I have to say, as I sort of start to announce this, and I hope we haven't got it up on the screen yet, um, that uh, there should be a drum roll uh, as, as I formally announce uh, who the new two collaboratives are, because it does give me really great pleasure to formally announce that the North East and South West Devon are the successful collaboratives going forward. Ah, brilliant. It worked. Uh, <laughs> And a huge congratulations uh, to them. And those of you who had been through this process to get there before they did know just how much work has to go in. So really, congratulations to all concerned. But we're not just adding uh, more collaboratives to the project. Existing collaboratives are also extending their reach as well. Even the most optimistic, I think, amongst us, um, I think wouldn't have dared to hope uh, for this uh, extension and this growth at this pace um, when this project started. And as the slide uh, that uh, has been put up clearly shows, um, all of the new sites from next year, uh, I think it really is great that we can welcome all of them into the IAP family and the program going forward. I'd also like, though, just to briefly reflect for a few moments on how far we've come. Because this project on this scale quite honestly, normally takes years. Normally takes years to plan. It takes even longer then to set up. And I see uh, a lot of ideas as a minister floating up and down the ministerial colleague at, uh, col cor cor corridor at Richmond House uh, uh, in the Department of Health. Uh, and many of those ideas can get entangled in the sort of spider's web of development and consultation, budget setting. And by the time they see the light of day, may be themselves out of date. Not so here. We've gone from a standing start 18 months ago to a position today where we can say that children from Paul to the Pennines are getting access to treatments they simply haven't had before. And by next year, over a third of under 19s will live in an area where CAMS has been transformed. That's four million lives potentially touched, potentially benefiting over time in all. And that's even more, I think what's even more exciting is that there is still more to come. The new e-learning programs will extend the skills and knowledge of all staff working with children and young people so they can learn much more about mental health issues. And when it comes to data, and we've heard about data and how uh, if I knew how much information I had, I wouldn't have asked for it in the first place. Uh, that slide very powerfully depicts. I think there is still a huge, huge gap between where we are and where I want us to be when it comes to not just the collection of data, but how that data is then used to inform practice. And as I think we've already heard, uh, as I heard earlier on when I arrived and sat down with a number of trainees uh, and supervisors, the value of session-by-session session monitoring means we can collect specific data on how effective CAMS is and quantifying what it achieves and how it helps children and young people themselves on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think what I also heard very clearly was how it affects practice itself, how it informs practice, how it helps you in the consulting room. So every child or young person gets a service that is personalized, that is tailored to them as an individual, rather than some toolkit that one takes off the shelf and just applies in a consistent and uniform way. But as well as helping the young people themselves, the data, I think, does something else. It really does mean that it proves the value of the service, it proves the value of the job that you do. And I think added to that is another innovation that we are moving at pace on, which I think can make a big difference going forward. And that's the idea of payment by results. Now, there's no question that payment systems that reward excellence improve the care people get. And we're working towards a system where money follows the patient. So it goes to providers who spend it in the most effective ways and look afresh at how to meet the needs that aren't met at the moment. Now, I think... Uh, your colleagues in adult mental health services will be intrigued by the new ways you are dealing with complex and often messy cases that crop up in CAM services and in how everything is targeted towards providing better access 
to better therapies. And indeed, when the Deputy Prime Minister and I visited the City of Islington uh, Academy to launch phase two of this program, we saw the forward thinking in ways which schools were commissioning uh, and using these services. And I was struck by a story, by a, a conversation that I had at the school of a boy who was a selective mute. Uh, a perfectly friendly, well-rounded boy uh, at home, but who refused to speak when he came to school. And that had a big impact on him and his peers and his life. And this clearly had hindered him from achieving his potential. And clearly, talking therapies weren't at that stage necessarily the most suitable approach for him. But the use of art, yes, uh, quite. Um, it wasn't intended to be a joke, but uh, it can be interpreted that way. Um, maybe I could have done with a cartoon or something. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but what they did is they used art. Um, and the art, the art therapy, I guess it was, uh, by the therapist, helped to bring him out uh, of himself. And before, uh, and as he slowly began to speak, they were then able to use other evidence-based therapies, which I'm told have helped him since to progress and have given him the best chance that he would want to reach his potential. And I think as we roll out the program and extend to new areas, the exciting e-portal, and in particular the work with counsellors, will offer real benefits in schools and in the community as well. So everyone who works with children and young people can develop their skills. One of the things I've heard as the minister in this area over the last year, the frustration that there's not always the engagement we need to have in our school system, and I think that can play a crucial part. And as much as we've made progress and are making progress and want to make more progress, um, I think there's another even bigger challenge that hinders this progress, and that's stigma. Tragically, a quarter of young people have said that stigma attached to their mental illness has made them give up on life. Sometimes, tragically, quite literally. And furthermore, 27% of young people with mental health problems under the age of 25 say that discrimination that they face as a result has made them give up on their life's ambitions. So stigma is a huge barrier. It's a huge barrier to even choosing to access services, even choosing to ask for help in the first place. It's the barrier above all that we have to knock down to really make a difference for people with mental health problems. Which is why I fought so hard to make sure that the government did fund the next phase of Time to Change and the anti-stigma and discrimination campaign that they are waging. And it's why I'm delighted that as part of the next phase of the work that they are doing, they are focusing particularly on children and young people. And the reason why they are doing that is this, because the research I just quoted, which was theirs, highlights that much of the stigma that young people face comes from those who you would expect them to turn to first in their moment of need, including friends, 70%, brothers and sisters, 35%, and parents, 57%. So if attitudes are to shift in society, it must be done at a young age. And on my visits, uh, I recall sitting in on an excellent class uh, lesson where children as young as 11 were learning about mental health and were displaying, I have to say, some views about mental health that were far more insightful, uh, far more mature than perhaps some of their adult peers uh, sometimes display. And I found that very encouraging. But that's not the norm yet. It has to become the norm. So openly talking about mental health problems really can start to break down stigma. I hope that many of you heard about the debate we had in Parliament a, a few weeks ago, initiated by some backbench members of Parliament with uh, a passion uh, that I share with them around mental health. And in that debate, some MPs for the first time openly discussed their own mental health problems of depression, of obsessive compulsive disorder. And they did that knowing that they were being broadcast live, knowing that their comments would be noted down and perhaps even sometime in the future used against them as evidence. And this kind of change, therefore, I think is incredibly powerful and should be incredibly heartening to all of us because I think it does perhaps mark a tipping point, a tipping point uh, for real change in our society. And in government, we certainly want to play our part and will shortly be publishing a number of things. A suicide prevention strategy, a mental health uh, strategy implementation framework, and a children and young people's health outcome strategy. But I guess if I'm honest, those documents labored over by people in the sector, worked through by officials in the department, signed off uh, and hopefully improved marginally by ministers commenting on them as well, are not of themselves enough. 
uh, they do not of themselves make the difference. It's people in this room who make the difference. It's people who want to take up a role and make this agenda one that makes a change in services up and down the country. Because in the end, it is about that one in 10 children. It is about individual children and young people. And I think, therefore, the progress that has been made in 18 months should be a source of great celebration for each and every one of you who've been involved in making it possible. And I think it's also a real beacon of hope, a sign of what is possible, a sign of a direction of travel, a sign, a road I hope we will go down at least as fast over the next 18 months as we've gone down it so far. So thank you very much for coming to this conference. Thank you very much for listening to me. And thank you very much for what you're doing.